Now let's listen for the message this morning. From unbelief to servanthood, Jesus appeared to James, and I'll give you our pastor, Pastor Noel Espinosa. Today is Easter. Since the year 325, that was in what was known, what is known in history as the Council of Nicaea, Western Christendom established Easter dating that Easter should be observed on the first Sunday after the first full moon after the equinox. The equinox on the Eastern Hemisphere, our hemisphere is March 21, the first equinox, and on the Western Hemisphere would be March 20. And that would make the earliest possible date of Easter to be March 22 and the latest to be April 25 and always on a Sunday. It was met with controversy during that time, but it soon became the prevailing view. Uh, actually, the Eastern Orthodox Church still observes a different day, date because they still use the Julian calendar, whereas most other countries in the world are using the Gregorian calendar. Now, I already made clear that I, I do not personally observe religious feasts established by tradition. I do not believe in the significance, much less of the holiness of any particular date with anything religious. But that said, I believe it is right to address whatever is in the minds of many and address that subject based upon the word of God. Now, Easter is supposed to be the remembering of the resurrection of Jesus. The right commemoration of his resurrection according to the scriptures is every Lord's Day. Every Sunday that we worship, we remember that our Savior, our Lord, is risen. But we share with all true professing Christians, whether Catholic or evangelical, our belief in the risen Jesus, that Jesus was raised from the dead, not in any symbolic or spiritual fashion, but bodily. There was a bodily resurrection. That's why when the disciples went to the tomb, it was empty. The body was not there. And it is the key evidences in establishing the historicity of the resurrection is eyewitness. We have eyewitnesses. Those who were close to Jesus saw him alive and they were transformed. But we will use one particular eyewitness who was special to Jesus himself. The appearance of Jesus to this eyewitness had a profound and we can say a revolutionizing effect on him. And he can also be used as a model of the transformative effect of believing in the resurrection of Jesus. We will have several readings today, but they all are joined together by one particular character. And we, I will invite you first to 1 Corinthians. I'll just read one text of chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 7, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And after that, we go to the book of Acts chapter 15 in what is known as the Jerusalem Council. After several exchanges, we find this man uh, expressing his thought, Acts 15, 12 to 19. <clears throat> And all the assembly fell silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, After this, I will return, and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord. And all the gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, makes this thing known from old, uh, who makes this thing known from of old to the gentiles who turn to God. One last reading is the opening of the letter of James, James chapter 1. And verse 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the, in the dispersion, greetings. 
So in all these readings, the common character is James. This is James, the brother of Jesus, part of the family to which Jesus belonged. Now, in the 12 apostles, there were two people who shared the name James. That's James, son of Zebedee, and James, son of Alphaeus. We know that James, son of Zebedee, brother of John, was killed by Herod Antipas early in the history uh, that Luke records in the book of Acts. As to James, the son of Alphaeus, nothing is known of what happened to him. But the James that is of common character here is neither of those two Jameses of the 12 apostles. James here was the brother of Jesus. Now, Jesus, of course, was the product of the virgin birth. And James followed Jesus in line when the crowd in Mark chapter 6, verse 3 mentioned the siblings of Jesus. The first one named was James. So why is the appearance of Jesus to James singled out by Paul as one of the key post-resurrection appearances? Now, of course, one reason is out of respect as James occupies a position of leadership in the Jerusalem church. But there is something more important, I believe, <clears throat> because of what it did to James. And James here is a model of the resurrection's effect on anyone to whom it becomes reality in the case of James by way of appearance. Now, it doesn't happen to us anymore, but when resurrection becomes a reality to us and accepted by faith, what happened to James can happen to us. And let me give you this by way of this message. My message is that faith in the reason Jesus radically transforms from hardened unbelief to caring servanthood. Ang pananampalataya sa nabuhay na muli na Panginoong Jesus ay nagbabago mula sa pagmamatigas ng walang pananampalataya sa pagmamalasakit ng isang lingkod. Faith in the risen Jesus radically transforms from hardened unbelief to caring servanthood. We can trace the life of James, the brother of Jesus, in two phases. One from unbelief and then to one of servanthood. And the transition point without doubt was when Jesus appealed to him after his resurrection. It changed him. And we also use the cross and the resurrection of Jesus, which of course are definitive of the gospel, for our own transformation, for conversion. And I want every one of you who still may be in a condition that is outside of faith in Jesus Christ to listen very well. And it is my prayer that the, Lord, the Lord's resurrection will become reality to you, not just as a way of accepting it as history, not just by way of accepting it as a doctrine, but make it such a reality that it will transform you the way it transformed James. And so let us look at those two faces in the life of James, which should be the two faces in our own lives when the resurrection becomes reality to us. The first is a life of hardened unbelief, ang buhay ng pagmamatigas sa hindi pananampalataya. And the second is a life of caring servanthood isang buhay ng nagmamalasakit na paglilingkod, a life of caring servanthood. Again, the transition point is the appearance of Jesus when His resurrection becomes reality. So the first is a life of hardened unbelief. It was noted in the Gospel accounts that the brothers of Jesus before the resurrection did not believe in Him. We read this in John chapter 7, verses 3 and following. His brothers said to him, Live here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers believed in him. Now you note here what the brothers said to Jesus your disciples, which means that they did not count themselves belonging 
to his disciples. And also something that you will note in their words is the tone of contempt. They were telling Jesus, well, let's show yourself to the world. If you are truly what you claim to be, then show yourself to the world. It was then the Passover and they were challenging Jesus, uh, prove yourself. And these brothers were not themselves believers. It is a kind of unbelief that carries a note of contempt. And considering that Jesus should be considered firstborn and the firstborn was someone in the culture of Israel is to be respected the way one respected his own father. But you see here the note of contempt on the part of the brothers of Jesus. And it tells us something that is very sobering, that unbelief is often hardened in the very proximity to the saving message of the gospel. Ang hindi pagsampalataya ay lalong nagmamatigas, lalot na lalapit sa mensahe ng Ibanghelyo. Kapag hindi ka tumugo ng pananampalataya, lalot na lalapit ka sa mensahe ay lalong nagmamatigas ang iyong puso sa pagsampalataya. In the case of the brothers of Jesus, how much more could one get to be so close to salvation itself. They do not only have a source of the gospel message, they have the message personified in the Lord Jesus. Jesus is the very substance of the gospel. And one thing that it proves, by the way, is that Jesus lives as true man, even in the presence of his family. Though never a sinner, not a single sin, very human. There are terms often portrayed in artworks, especially in the Middle Ages, that Jesus somehow had a halo upon his head. Well, clearly and obviously, that was not the case when he was with his family. He was just like any ordinary man so that his own siblings, his own brothers did not believe in him, including the next of kin, James himself. So it is delusional to imagine that belonging to a family of believers makes it automatic to believe. Uh, it, perhaps one may be thinking that belonging to a family where there is a serious Christian or there are serious Christians, it has its inclusive effect on the rest of the family. Now I say, yes, there is an advantage if there is in the family a serious Christian. But salvation, no, it is not automatic. In fact, what the Bible teaches is that it has a compounding effect. The more proximate you become to the message of the gospel, the more you hear it, the heavier will be the penalty when that is not met with faith. Even in the case of Jesus' own family and siblings, they needed to respond to him individually. And so with you, it is to your advantage to have a Christian in your, in your family, but you must respond. You must believe. You must repent. And no matter that your family may be Christian, that does not make you one until you yourself individually come to faith in Jesus Christ. I'm asking you to respond now to Jesus the more that you are brought near to the message of the gospel, the more you have this responsibility and the more you have this compounded culpability. If you keep on procrastinating, it has that hardening effect. The closer you are to the message of the gospel, you're having a Christian in your blood. Family is good on the one hand, but on the other hand, it is compounding because you need to respond individually. Now we know that in the present rollout of the vaccine, not everyone, not every individual really needs to be vaccinated. And there are those who still may have some doubts and probably they are waiting for that so-called herd uh, immunity and when that is reached, those who have not been vaccinated will themselves benefit. Now oh, that's possible for physical sickness, but that is not the case with your spiritual condition. 
There is no herd salvation. There is no family salvation. Yeah, salvation is something that you must individually respond to in order to obtain. Respond to the message of the gospel. James has the best advantage possible. But he never responded until Jesus appeared to him. And Jesus does not need to make a personal appearance now. His authenticity is proved in the scriptures. And when you believe in the scriptures, their testimony to the fact that Jesus died for sinners and rose again from the dead, that is as good as, if not better than, an appearance. After all, Jesus told Thomas, remember, in John 20, 28, and 29, after Thomas acknowledged him, my Lord and my God, Jesus told him, blessed are you because you have seen and you have believed, but more blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And therefore, my challenge to you is believe in the reason Jesus as proof and part of the gospel message of salvation. Manampalataya ka sa Jesus na nabuhay na muli bilang katibayan at bahagi ng mensahe ng Ebanghelyo tungo sa kaligtasan. The complete message of salvation includes the death and resurrection of Christ according to the scriptures. That's the way Apostle Paul defined it just before our text where Jesus appeared to James. Paul defines the gospel in this way. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and following, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So this is the gospel, that Christ died without Christ's death. There is no gospel. But also Christ rose from the dead and without the resurrection, there also is no gospel. The gospel is accepting and responding to believing in the Jesus who died for our sins and rose from the death, from, from the dead. His death, I explained in my just concluded series, is the death of a substitute before the law of God. That's why a guilty sinner can have Jesus as his Lord and Savior and stand before God without fear of his wrath and judgment because Jesus took it all. But what if Jesus remained dead? Then he would be no different from other would-be saviors of which there were many in the ancient world and they all died. But they are no savior because they are dead. Now it is obvious that James did not play a role in the burial of Jesus, which should have been a family concern. We can only speculate. Certainly there must be grief on his part, perhaps even pity. But maybe he thought he brought it upon himself. James was not even on the cross. When Jesus commended the care of his mother, Mary, he commended her, not to James, who was supposed to be second in line to Jesus. That's supposed to be the cultural thing to do. But Jesus commended Mary to John. And that shows that James was not even there. There was no faith on the part of James, even at and after the death of Jesus, not until Jesus appeared to James. Then everything changed. So the death of Jesus alone does not yet constitute gospel faith, though it is central to it. You need to believe in the reason Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus means that his death has had its effects a sacrifice that God accepted for sinners. 
and this is salvation according to Romans 10 and verse 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So when all this was done, Jesus chose to appear to his next of kin brother, James. Isn't that touching? Jesus did not forget his family and he made an appearance to his next of kin. And you can probably speculate and let your imagination play that during their childhood, they were playmates. Jesus in all his humanity went through all the childhood that a human being goes through and they must have been close. But somewhere along the line, when Jesus began to claim messiahship, that's when James probably began to distance himself. But now that Jesus rose from the dead, among others, he appeared to his brother, James. And that gives such a revolutionizing effect on someone. When he has a faith in the resurrection of Jesus, he looks at death differently. It was said that when Dietrich von Heffer was about to be hanged on the command of Adolf Hitler, his words, the words he uttered were, Oh God, this is the end, but for me, the beginning of life. That's how it changes a man. There is that beginning of life which to many is the end Jesus rose from the dead. This was James in a life of hardened belief. Yet he was patiently or still in that phase of life. And may happen, the second phase will happen to you. A life of caring servanthood. Isang buhay ng nagmamalasakit na paglilingkod. What James became after the appearance of Jesus to him is nothing short of revolutionizing, radical. In fact, James himself became an apostle. Though not belonging to the twelve, he became the leader of the Jerusalem church. Now, we will never become such as what happened to James. But more important, Important for us is the transformed character of James because Jesus appeared to him. The graciousness of Jesus to us in our life of sin will be reflected in servanthood to sinners. Ang mabiyayang pakikitungo ni Jesus sa atin nang tayo makasalanan ay masasalamin sa ating Pagmamalasakit sa makasalanan. We could use two evidences in our texts that portray the changed character of James, both of which we could trace to that revolutionizing appearance of the risen Jesus to him. One is his leadership of the Jerusalem Council. He was a moderating force against the Judaizers. The issue in the Jerusalem Council was when some Jewish converts to Christianity began to insist that Gentiles could not just be received fully into the church unless they become Jews by way of circumcision. And it was Peter who made a testimony that the Lord has made very clear the reality of the salvation of Gentiles without undergoing any of the Jewish rites. And in the Jerusalem Council, it was Paul with Barnabas because of the effects of their first missionary journey that shows Gentiles are being saved. And yet the Judaizers wanted to impose those Jewish rites on them. And what does James say in the reading that we made in Acts 15, 19? He says, my judgment is that we should not trouble the Gentiles who have turned to God. Of the several words in Greek for troubling, the word that James used here 
is one of continuing annoyance. You don't annoy them. You don't trouble them. If they are turning to God, why should you impose anything that will simply put them off? Over and above the issue of the true gospel, which is of first importance, as Paul says, I believe that James must be funneling this issue through his own experience. How com contemptuous he was of Jesus, as we saw. And Jesus was tender to him, so much so that one of his post-resurrection appearances was to his own brother. And here now James did not want the conversion of Gentiles to be made any difficult as Jesus did not make it difficult for him, though he was contemptuous of the character and claims of Jesus initially. When Jesus appeared to him, he was transformed to being a servant. So that's one evidence. James, in his leadership of the Jerusalem Council, was mindful of the conversion of Gentiles without imposing anything to make it more difficult. But the second evidence is the only letter written by James that is included in the New Testament canon, and it is in the introduction, how he introduced himself. He could have introduced himself as brother of Jesus. Instead, his self-introduction is a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here we see the transformation of a man who saw the meaning of the resurrection of Jesus. He is now Lord. In the preaching of Peter on the initial Pentecost proclamation of the gospel, it is at the resurrection that Jesus is said to have sat on the throne of his father, David. So with the resurrection, Jesus is now king. Jesus is now Lord. And there is no other such claim that can be considered authentic and historical than the claim of Jesus. This is what the sequential significance of the humiliation of Jesus in his death, which became his exaltation at the resurrection, which Paul says in Philippians 2, 9, he was given a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord. It is either you do it now, or you will do it on the judgment day, but then it is no longer saving. Every sinner must be in union with Jesus by faith in his death and his resurrection for him to be saved. And I am appealing to you, this is what's offered for your salvation. Jesus died. Jesus rose from the dead. And now he is offered to you as Lord and Savior. Why would you keep procrastinating? Why would you keep delaying your response to Christ when he is offered to you now? And that will revolutionize your life the way it did James' life. I've been watching the news on vaccination and it's sometimes heartbreaking to see long lines for the vaccine only to be told for those who were last online that they have run out of supply, that they cannot have the vaccine. Well, fortunately, that is not the gospel. The gospel offer of salvation is not running out of supply. It is your responsibility. It is your privilege to hear the gospel and respond now to the offer of that gospel. My challenge is for believers, count your servanthood to Christ as your honor more than any status. Ibilang mo ang iyong pagiging lingkod ni Jesus na siya mong karangalan kaysa sa anumang katayuan dito sa mundo. 
some have more status of this world and of this life than many of us combined can ever have, can ever attain. But if you know the radically transforming effects of the death and resurrection of Jesus, then you will say with the Apostle Paul in Philippians 3, 7, and 8, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing wars of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for his sake. I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Here's Paul, another one who was radically, radically transformed when Jesus made an appearance to him on the road to Damascus. And when Jesus made an appearance to him, he made a revolutionizing and radical alteration of the values of life. Everything that he sought was his status now is loss compared to gaining the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the transformative effect of the resurrection of Jesus when we come to accept it by faith. There is nothing like the resurrection of Jesus in all the stories of religion. We must accept it as history, but more than history as a passing interest among other miracles, it is proof of all that Jesus claimed for himself as Lord and Savior. His resurrection also is the guarantee of the resurrection of all those in union with him by faith. The implication of that is that if we are believers, ultimately we do not belong to this life. We are, as Paul said, citizens of heaven. We will not have James' experience of Jesus appearing to us. But the Bible says in Hebrews 9, 28, he will appear a second time. And so the thought of a true believer in Jesus is that his life is not about the things he, are, he is gaining in this world. His life is preparation for that second appearing of Jesus. Are we ready for that? Are we anticipating that? Is our life lived for that? We must have a meaning of life that is far above this earthly life. Because this earthly life will just end in death. And we are seeing death all around us. Every day they are counting it in statistics. And one of these days, perhaps in years to come, we will be in one of those statistics. But for the believer joined to Christ, Jesus' resurrection has become reality to him. And whenever that death comes and claims his earthly life, he can say, this is not all I have got. It may be the end of my earthly pilgrimage, but the beginning of another one. Robert Murray McShane was a powerful Scottish preacher who died in 1843. He died young before he reached his 30th year of age. But even in his short-lived life, he was fruitful in his service for Christ. And one of the reasons is because his mindset was determined by the life to come when he is in glory and when he shares the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. In one of his just few hymns, he expressed this by saying when this passing world is done when i sunk the radiant sun and when i stand with christ on high looking over life's history then lord shall i fully know not till then and this is the way every verse of this hymn ends how much i owe meaning comes to the core of our humanity when we know how much we owe to christ and that will only be when the death and resurrection of Jesus becomes real to us. As Jesus appeared to James, may Jesus 
be real to you by faith, even today. 